concludes that this sort of argument has appeal, that the concept of structure is essential to all or most, or most natural sciences, uh, that if something is essential to a valid mode of explanation or understanding, it should be conceived realistically, and therefore real structures in the world uh, exist. Uh, there are real in the world. And, but to that, he counterposes the following uh, position, I say, that also seems to have appeal, that it is sufficient for the concept of structure to be applicable in fact elements be appropriately related in the world, and these relations can be characterized without employing the notion of structure. This could be done by specifying the special temporal location of the elements and their causal influence on each other. So, it basically concludes that if structure, the, the, that there is nothing left for structure to do if we have a complete physical, physical or uh, bottom level description of something, basal level of something, let's say, and as such, the structures contribute nothing over and above uh, the basic forces of physics. Uh, and as entities, they have nothing, there, is, there is nothing above their constituent parts. So he rejects this idea of a form of top-down causation and argues that everything has to be bottom-up. Let's, let's say. Uh, the first question to, to, to ask Robinson and people doing arguments like this is uh, why should we even bother with with, with both other physics, especially the Aristotelian? Because what seems to be at stake here is the very concept of physics, uh, or physical. The Aristotelian just has a different concept of physical than Robinson. And as such, applying to a reductive concept of physical from the start seems to be question begging. And the reason why Robinson does that is because he seems to think that so he doesn't. He never says this explicitly, but it's in the text. Something like one, Aristotelian wants their position to be compatible with our best modern science. Therefore, two, uh, uh, not therefore, but two, that is uh, not possible whilst rejecting also cultural physics. And and that is a not not an obvious move. Uh, first, because causal closure is not a scientific principle; it's a philosophical principle. Uh, it, it's not clear that it's needed to do philosophical, uh, to do scientific work. Maybe it is as a methodological principle, but not as a methodological principle. And CCP is thus, at best, uh, a principle that is drawn from a certain conclusion of the sciences, but not the only way to interpret the sciences or to do science. Uh, as such, as a, a first note, I would argue that if the Aristotelian rejects or fails to accommodate causal closure, uh, one might only conclude that philomorphism is not consistent with a specific materialist or physicalist ontology, not in science itself. So that is the first problem for Robinson. But I think there are also philosophy of problems, rather empirical problems with causal closure. So, and here, uh, I, I wish I had more time and space because I think Robinson's uh, argument is very reminiscent of Yai Won Kim's argument uh, for causal closure. It's basically the same thing. Uh, all causal activity has to be happening at the bottom level, and, and he has this um, formal argument for it. Uh, all the emergents are ultimately reducible to, to basal level properties, let's say. And that is basically what Robinson is arguing for. So, Number one is problematic, and I, see, I think you'll see that in the comments that I should have laid down better. But he argues that there is a perspective of the whole, that there are, actually, that there are no, no, no holes, just congregations of parts, let's say. Uh, and that real causal activity has to be purely bottom up. Uh, so we might appeal to higher level factors, but those do not track real causes, they are just uh, conceptual or pragmatic. But I, I would argue that under this rather limited view of closure, not even physics is close to physics. So since writing this article for the conference, I, uh, I think I got better arguments from physics. And they come mostly from quantum mechanics, but those are not the ones I'm presenting here. Uh, the ones I'm presenting here are, first of all, related to quark. So if we take this idea of also closure seriously, one will have to appeal to the most fundamental level, and that would be the quarks, you know, the, the smallest, let's say, the most fundamental particle you know. The, but the problem is that the theory of quark confinement states that a single quark is never found alone. Uh, so 
when we think about uh, quarks, we have to think holistically from the beginning. Uh, and this, I would argue, defies common sense closure requirements. And we'll discuss that more in the discussion section. And the same goes, I would argue, for the quality principle, uh, this time regarding electrons. So the idea is basically that, uh, I don't think I would read all that, but that a free electron behaves differently than a bound electron. And that is, I would say, it's not unpredictable, uh, at least not expected, given uh, Robinson's uh, uh, requirements for the causal closure of the system. So, this presents a dilemma to Robinson and, and defenders of causal closure, which is that even at the most fundamental level, the most fundamental parts can be understood outside a larger whole. Um, and Robinson here could argue that, okay, sure, uh, we, we cannot explain it. Uh, we may be, we, we may need to appeal to something like structure or form or uh, whatever you want, you want to call it. But that doesn't show that that all of structure or form has uh, any real causal power. Uh, but this, and I, I agree with Jaworski here, introduces an asymmetry in the general picture of how explanations are related to causes. So. Uh, Robinson argues that anything operating above, above the most fundamental level or the, the basal level of physics uh, does not map to causes at all, but only to mere explanatory possibilities, so parts of explanatory schemes. What he does to explain is that we should believe this claim, because it seems impossible in the human fashion. Uh, and it seems, it's, its possibility, according to Jaworski, uh, lies in granting that explanatory schemes of physics express causes, but the same does not happen to in other sciences. But I think this is even deeper if we consider what I just what I said previously. Because even at the physical level, Robinson would have to ultimately argue that the proton, for instance, is a mere explanatory possible of the quark. And uh, that follows, I believe, also for, for Kim and his understanding of, of, of closure. Uh, so given that the total schemes in physics also have to appeal to higher order factors when understand the most fundamental level. Robinson will have to ultimately argue that only some explanatory schemes uh, map to causes, even in physics. So that creates uh, a bigger, an even bigger dilemma for, for Robinson and physical. So what do you mean by, by physics? Is it only uh, particle physics, let's say? What about quasars and galaxies? Uh, are those close under physics? Uh, that seems to be a problem. And then, uh, in his papers, Robinson goes on to, to, to deal with allomorphism and defenders of allomorphism. And um, in my opinion, he just keeps avoiding the real issue, which is what Aristotle actually meant by substances, so living organisms, for example. Uh, I, so I don't have time to, to go into this here, but uh, I tend to agree with some of Robinson's arguments when applied specifically to Kozlicki or Kitfine or Jaworski. They have a rather uh, diminished view of, of, of form uh, and illomorphism that I think is wrong. I would agree more with Marmogoro or uh, over, over there uh, that uh, form should be treated as a principle that can be identified with real parts of the whole or as an irreducibly holistic principle of specificity of the thing. These are big terms, I know. <laughs> Just to uh, notice that forms have to be structured. That, that, that's the point. Or maybe it is not structured. And Robinson seems to notice this. So in his later, in his more, most recent paper, he discusses the work of Marmogoro. And he, he says that she claims, with strong mapping from the text, that form is not structured because form is not a definition of parts, as a structure is by definition. And the essence of form unity and that unity is basically has to do with the way form transforms all the material parts of a, uh, uh, a substance towards the same single causal line, let's say. And I agree with this. The interesting thing is that Robinson never actually tackles the paradigmatic cases of substances in Marmogoro or any other account. For instance, he she uh, uses this analogy that, that, that just as a water, a drop of water poured into a bucket, uh, of water loses its individual identity when it mixes with the rest, uh, it says 
that he, he says, he asks, is this water drop analogy valid in a system closed under physics? Is it not more like the history of a brick which retains its identity when incorporated in the building? And that is certainly true. Uh, the, the, the case of the drop of water is way more like a, a brick in a building than uh, H2O in my organism, for instance. Uh, but that is because the house and the water bucket are not genuine substances or paradigmatic cases of substances. Uh, organisms are, for instance, but he never treats organisms. And so what Marmogoro does, and Aristotle does this a bunch as well, is to provide an analogy to understand matter and form. Uh, well, this is a lot of things, I'm sorry. So the, the same goes for Johnson's theory. So Johnson has this distinction between static and dynamic forms. The basic idea is that in dynamic forms, uh, parts or its material is constantly changing or is constantly being replaced. Robinson also deals with this. He says maybe this helps the automorphous, but then he, he, so he, he says paradigms of the last dynamic forms are living organisms, though flames and fountains are also cited. And what does he tackle? Flames and fountains instead of the paradigmatic cases. So he says that uh, sure, flames and fountains may look theological or whatever, uh, but uh, that is certainly not the case. Uh, uh, what we have is only uh, the internal dynamics of the particles alone. Uh, and he concludes that from this bad example, let's say, that it seems to be uh, that this view of, of form is a rule of form in Arizona. If Marshall is matter, given that matter is of, of the appropriate kind, but in the flame and the fountain, the relative particles marshal themselves. And what I would say is that, sure, it, it is like the role of form, but it's not the actual role of form in Aristotle, because a river is not a substance. The same goes for flame, I would say. Uh, and without actually discussing these paradigmatic cases of, of substances, Robinson just dismisses uh, lomorphism and says that if standards and scientific views are correct, the same applies to living organs. <coughs> but this is a half seat generalization and he's not granted in doing that move. So what is the crucial difference between substantial forms uh, of, of real substances like organisms and accidental forms or art artifactual forms, I think we could call them? Um, I would say that in a more robustly recipient sense, form is better conceived as an irreducibly holistic principle of specificity of the same, and this is other word that reidentifies material parts of an entity toward the same end as a singular process system. This is Marmogoro. Something like that, we can probably make this shorter and or more concise. But what this means is that form is not just a privileged sort of property whose causal operations bring together an entity's otherwise ideologically distinct parts, but the very activity of informed matter. And I agree with Austin here that the best way to understand it is as uh, matter and form is like capacity and activity or organ operation, not as virological disparate parts interacting with each other in some way. And the big difference, and, and what Robinson seems to miss, is that in the case of artifacts, their forms are the exercise of any powers of its matter. There is no sense in which the architectural configuration of a house constitutes the activity of its constituents. So there is nothing in the grid that naturally houses, let's say. Uh, but in the case of organisms, such as a fox, for instance, when a fox dies, what remains is not the body or the matter of the fox. But um, even though there may remain a perfectly preserved, structurally intact organic mass, there now exists nothing which has the capacity for foxiness, nothing which is potentially foxy. That is naturally foxy, let's say. In the case of bricks, that has, that there is a sense in which the brick houses, let's say but it's always imposed from above, from the maker, from the, the human beings. It's not the, 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 the sort of natural teleology or increasing teleology that we find in our Okay, so And this example of the fox echo, echoes uh, some uh, examples that are from the And the point is that the corpse, uh, in, in, contrast, in contrast to a body here, uh, might keep all the material components and structure that it had before uh, when the fox was alive, but something was lost when the body became a new corpse, 
and that is not capturable at the level of its periodical constituents. Uh, because of that, form a property or an extra neurological feature of things, but, ra but rather what grants the unity a metaphysical oneness of substances beyond mere togetherness. That's what grants their interest in the ultimate. And of course, with this, we are reinstating form, not only form, but also what Robinson calls an embarrassing feature of the Aristotelian system, teleology. But I think that, in fact, that is not a, an embarrassing feature, but a growing part uh, of the, the, the causal grammar of the sciences. So uh, this last part I would like to look a little bit into even the biology. Uh, a lot of work has been done on this by Aristotelians. And the basic point is that biology was mostly governed by this idea of the, the modern synthesis. And the modern synthesis is in general way more akin to what how Robinson, for instance, seems to think about causality and, and the causal closure principle. Because populations were basically conceived as gene pools and from their evolution, diversity and morphogenesis uh, was mostly understood in terms of quantitative, quantitative mathematical models, uh, tracking the description of, of genes in a given genetic pool across time. So uh, this led basically to this belief that one needed only general statistical laws about the interactions among individuals, rather than specific knowledge of the individual themselves to, to understand the evolution and the mechanisms of biology. This has been challenged recently, uh, even though this picture is closer to Howard Robinson's view of, of nature, uh, as he takes a generally bottom-up stance on, on, on explanation of causality in general, where organisms are basically being pushed and pulled uh, and pulled passive, uh, passively by selective pressures. Um, what modern biologists have understood, and this is becoming a trend after, since the 90s, I believe, uh, is that that rhythm flow of genetic variation, uh, which forms the raw material for the selective processes shaping organism morphology, have privileged probabilities. There are a number of pathways that are uh, privileged as, uh, as well when it comes to the development, the development of an organism. And, and these are not just the result of extrinsic, for, of extrinsic forces acting on them, but rather of their own nature, let's say, or their own uh, forms. So two basic tenets of evil devil uh, are these ideas of robustness and plasticity. And I believe both of them have to be understood theologically. Uh, uh, basically, what they show is that um, um, in, in both cases, organisms have a number of different ways uh, or pathways to, to get to the same end, causal end. For instance, uh, maintaining thermostatic equilibrium uh, or just maintaining themselves alive, <laughs> which is uh, theological. And what I would say is that robustness and plasticity, for example, more things point to this, but these are paradigmatic cases of cold retroactivity in the sense that they display this idea that you can reach one end state by a number of alternative pathways, and if one pathway is blocked, another one opens and they do it towards, uh, not towards, uh, in that, uh, that manner. So there is a question, uh, is this explicable in terms of mechanisms or can we just explain teleology with, uh, away without using teleological concepts such as plasticity and robustness that I would argue are teleological concepts? Uh, we have good reasons to think not. So the most influential account of uh, mechanisms in biology uh, basically takes them to be a, a structure performing a function in virtue of its complement parts, operations, and organization. So they basically decompose and localize systems. They are broken down into spatial temporally discrete element, discrete elements, and they assign functional roles to each of these elements. Uh, the question is then, can we understand robustness and plasticity in these terms? And people like Austin, and I, I agree with them, argue that we can't. And one of the reasons we can't is that the, 
the process of development in modular complemented system as a stepwise cause of progression through a series of discrete state changes in a collection of isolated locations. That, that, that's not what's happening, but rather um, a process as a continuous series of temporarily successive transitions between entire system states. So what we have and what we are dealing with is entire system states, not uh, component parts acting on their own. And it's pretty much impossible to understand to understand what the system as a whole uh, is doing by just considering the component parts. So in summary, what Austin thinks and uh, what I believe Ivo points to is this idea that since the topological structure in which both features are grounded is itself not a computational element of an object system or strictly reducible to any such element or set thereof, uh, teleology is uneliminable in biology, especially evolutional biology. Uh, what we get instead is a set of comprehensive whole system states, not discrete uh, uh, and atomized, let's say, uh, modular systems that we understand only that way. So, in conclusion, what you say in a rather restricted fashion, a fashion that plasticity and robustness that we find in organisms is grounded in the whole, not in the component parts of the organism, and being uh, system level features that can be reduced to any of the parts of the system discreetly, uh, this ideology exposed by plasticity, uh, plasticity and robustness is also irreducible or ineliminable. Uh, in That's wrong. So it turns out that all those to an idea of four as a place in contemporary science, at least in biology, uh, I have made the case for physics because I don't know if there are natural kinds of physics, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but contrary to what Robinson has argued, I would say it is the causal closure picture of nature that goes against what we are uh, seeing and doing in contemporary science nowadays. And it seems that recent developments in contemporary science point more and more towards this more recently and robustly concept of causation and uh, formal causation, final causation into the object. As such, it is CCP that doesn't fit nature as we now understand. So, thank you.
short paragraph that Tara had on the PowerPoint. The theory of core confinement states that a single core is never found alone. That is, there are no free quarks. They exist only within a large core. A proton is made of three quarks, for example. But if you try to separate them, you need a great deal of energy, and then you end up creating more quarks, which combine with the ones you already have to make new protons and other particles. Quarks are parts that apparently cannot exist except in a larger core. So I had two clarification questions about quark confinement, because I don't know a lot about quark confinement, and then a question about how it applies to this. First, right, the first sentence of the paragraph says that no single quark is ever found alone. I was interested in what the strength of that claim is supposed to be. Does that mean that no quarks were ever found alone ever in the history of the universe, not even in the early universe? Um, am I supposed to import modal content into that claim, right, that they can't be found alone? I wasn't sure, and I would just like to hear a little bit more about that. Um, question two. So you claim that, or Joe, I'm um, sorry. Probably not. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> is that okay? Um, uh, I'm just timing you eight to ten minutes. Okay. Maybe you do it all. Yeah, if it's over, I'll just get yeah, it. Yeah, all yeah. right. I'll respond to that right <laughs> uh, Question two. So Joel claims that quarks only exist within a larger hole. Um, uh, and uh, Joel exhibits that claim by appealing to another coin, right? That if you try to separate the quarks in a proton, you end up creating more quarks that combine with existing quarks or trying to isolate. But I wasn't sure how that latter claim exhibits the former claim, right? So I'm thinking like, okay, just because every time you try to rip the quarks apart, you can't do it, and you end up creating more quarks. I didn't see how that shows you that quarks can never be found isolated. I thought it was um, mainly showing you something like you can't isolate them um, via these processes. So I'm not, I'm not questioning that stronger claim that they're never found isolated, but I guess I was just wondering how those two claims are supposed to relate to each other. So those are my clarification questions about core confinement. Question three, which clause of the closure principle do, does the court's case conflict with? So I wasn't sure about this, right? So at first I thought maybe it was clause A. Basic physics applies to the basic constituents without within complex structures, their quarks, as much as to them when we're isolated. But here I was thinking, well, no, if it's true that quarks are never isolated, then clause A is going to be trivially satisfied because basic physics is going to apply to the quarks in the, just the same when they're isolated and when they're not because they're never isolated. So I was wondering um, if I'm understanding that clause right or if instead the quarks case is supposed to conflict with clause B. But I didn't quite see the conflict with clause B, at least not yet, because nothing um, so far in the quarks case mentioned causation or causal so that's my, those are my main questions about core confinement. Um, case two that Joao brings up is the quality exclusion principle. I thought this was such an interesting case. So Joao says that even at the most fundamental level, the most fundamental parts can't be understood outside the larger whole. Um, so I thought, that, I thought that's a really interesting thought. And Joao quotes Dodds to support this claim, this discussion of the quality exclusion principle. Could I read that out quickly? The sodium ion atom, the sodium atom is composed of a nucleus and 12 neutrons and 11 protons and has 11 orbital electrons. But none of these act independently. Each act is only part of the whole, following laws that apply to the whole, such as Bohr's quantum rules and the Pauli exclusion principle. A quote unquote free electron, for instance, will act only according to its own mass and electric charge, but an electron that is bound within the sodium atom obeys the Bohr's quantum. The bound electron also follows the Pauli exclusion principle. This principle considers the atom as a whole and specifies that within the atom no two electrons can have the same state. So here too I was just wondering which clause of the closure principle is supposed to be violated. Clause A, clause B, or both. So here too we don't have any explicit mention of causal efficacy. But I wasn't sure maybe I was supposed to read some, read some more into this um, about what about the whole having causal efficacy um, over and above its parts. But uh, so I was thinking, I didn't know yet whether it's supposed to conflict with clause B. I was thinking maybe Joel had in mind a conflict with clause A. Basic physics applies to the basic constituents without within complex structures as much as to them when they're isolated. I was thinking maybe the idea is something like, hey, maybe the Pauli exclusion principle counts as a piece of basic physics. And it only applies to these electrons when they are bound. 
um, and not when they're free. So maybe that's supposed to be a kind of instance where you're having a piece of basic physics applied to um, uh, contact at the parts. But then I was just curious, well, I was just curious, like, okay, then that means that the poly exclusion principle counts as a, a piece of basic physics? What exactly does that mean? How do I distinguish the pieces of basic physics? Do these different principles count as that? And is that, yeah, I just wanted to know uh, a little bit more about how to flesh that out. And those are the extent, that's the extent of my questions. So thanks again, to Jeff. I saw your name first, and then I'm going to go around this way. Uh, 
uh, you know, I think um, uh, it's good to focus on the separating between questions. I think uh, there's a long tradition in uh, emergency thinking which pays um, not position uh, that is true. And one of the things that I, I would qualify better is that I, I would phrase this in terms of strong and weak emergence. And, and what Robinson is denying and what and what causal code denies is strong emergence. Yeah, exactly. But strong emergence, if one accepts the three of strong emergence, uh, which I do, uh, of course, that, that, that does not violate the laws of physics. Uh, yeah. right. That just, let's say, qualifies them or structures them or whatever. Well, well, add additional yes, yeah, that's right. um, yeah. uh, so, and I'm not sure if the, um, uh, the, the exclusion principles are such a good case because it is um, uh, sort of embedded in, uh, for instance, in quantum uh, statistics or general principles. Yes. Um, uh, and uh, some of the spin statistics still. Uh, but but I, th I think that this is implicated in that we talk about um, a multiple organization structure, uh, like the things that we talked about. My point with the Pauli exclusion principle is that one has to start holistically to understand it. Uh, and, and, and that is not what should follow from closure if you understand it in the very strong way that Robert Swan can understand it. And I think that's how this is a lot of the physicists see it. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Um, so there are a lot of questions that I could ask you. I'm trying to figure out, but uh, I suppose the, the question that I would have is I very much appreciate the way that you frame this. I find kind of your overall case against Robinson. And I'll leave, although I'm not super familiar with his position. Uh, however, I guess the, I'm going to just give you a very broad question, which you might not be able to respond to much. Give me an advance of that in the big case. Um, so I find your position compelling as far as pointing out why Robinson's case against kind of uh, a neo um, hypermorphic view shouldn't be taken seriously. But I wonder what you would say in response, because uh, it seems like there are alternate positions out there in the literature. So something like um, John Gray's process ontology or something. Right. So it seems like there are all these other sorts of alternatives floating around out there um, that might be a threat to a sort of yes. pilot view. So I, I just was curious. Um, yeah, so I hard. find your thesis yeah, convincing against Robinson, maybe not as much as why I should adopt a pilot view myself. Yeah, it's easier to destroy than to construct. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, what I would say is that the allomorphic position has all the benefits of process metaphysics, plus it grants the unity of substances that seems to be lacking in process metaphysics. That would be my fast response. Um, so, uh, my first comment is on the quarks. So my understanding, I don't know if I'm correct, uh, my understanding is that quarks are very unstable, so they need to be in groups, but just imagine the case that you were saying that if you uh, put more energy, they, they become um, more protons or something. So there's like one millisecond or something when they are exchanging parts. So you can see that when they are exchanging, the parts are kind of isolated or kind of moving by itself, right? So they're not. So in that case, when they are exchanging, the parts are not moving as a whole, but like each individual goes somewhere else. Yes, sure, but that happens. I, I, I don't think I would deny that the parts move on their own in some way. It's that they ultimately reconfigure towards the next thing, which is to be in a full drop, for example. That, that, that is my, what I would say. This is what's helpful. Um, my second question is on the, also on the causal closure principle. I mean, because it seems that you don't even need to go to like deep uh, particle physics to just by how you or how you present or how I understand it because I've never read all these papers. So, um, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding because just think about, for example, H2O when they're in water form, of course they have very different 
dynamics and the causal, very different causal relations with the external objects, comparing to when the stores are in um, uh, uh, air form, right? So, uh, I don't know whether that makes sense. Of course, you have to, you know, the, the, the causal relations and dynamics are very different with the same constituents. So, you can find that kind of examples everywhere in physics, right? In, any non-fundamental physics, so... Yeah, maybe I make Robinson's position and maybe Kim's position sound too stupid. It's not as stupid as that. Uh, it's pretty stupid in my opinion, but, but not as stupid as that. So, uh, they deal, of course, with this idea that uh, hydrogen is inflammable, but water uh, puts fire away. Uh, so, how does that happen? Uh, Robinson always says that we have to look at the most basic particles, let's say, and their relations. And it seems to me, in the relations that that is uh, embedded, that new properties can arise. But I don't think they have the metaphysical frame to actually understand that, mm -hmm. and, and to actually build a incoherent theory of why emergence occurs. I don't think they do so. Yeah, really enjoy that. Uh, well, thank you. Um, yeah, a lot of we said about, we really have a question rather than just kind of comment or observation. So I think you're quite right to point out, you know, Robinson's kind of problem with causal closure, right? So you hear it a lot, don't you, among critics of other authors? They say, well, that, that, that doesn't fit with our best science. And immediately you sort of think, well, firstly, what's our best science? Secondly, what do you mean does it fit? And then you ask, well, what is it that's bothering you? And they might say, for example, that's Robinson does causal closure. And then immediately, well, well, we all know that there's no canonical formulation of causal closure. It's formulated in different ways by different people. And Robinson's version of causal closure is actually not, I'm not sure that it even is the kind of dominant way no, that right. causal closure is formulated. Because he formulates it as microphysical, right? So, um, and then it's, what is something like every microphysical effect has a sufficient microphysical cause. That's not canonical. That, if there is any canonical causal closure, that's not it. Yes. Right? That's very specific. It's that. And you might say to him, well, okay, suppose I grant that. Suppose I accept every microphysical effect has a sufficient microphysical cause. I'm happy to grant that. Uh, what's it got to do with explaining, I don't know, digestion? You know? And, and then, ah, well, let me tell you about digestion. That's really all about the interactions, like, you know, great about you know, so then, not only, not only is he bringing a philosophical principle, really, causal closure, but a very specific version of that, which not everyone signs up to, yeah. people using it, and also a bunch of physicalistic reductionism gets thrown into the mix as well. Well, actually, if you're talking about digestion, that's really going to have to break that down into a very strange. So there's a whole lot of metaphysics and that goes into it. Yes. Before he can get to the position of saying, and it doesn't fit with our best science. Yes. Which he does in the first kind of agree with the you. article. So that was, yeah. But it, and so in defense of of Howard, I would say that not Howard or Robinson, I would say that I think that in fact he's just coherent in defending causal closure. I think that the, the more recent or robust views of closure ultimately uh, fall into this sort of closure of microphysical closure. That is the logical end of every form of closure, in my opinion. So he's just the incoherent, and, and that is why, and, and Kim uh, seems to notice that as well. That it, it really has to be the basal properties of all the work, and that's my uh, They can always do that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's something in defense of them. Uh, at the same time, it, it doesn't make the position more intelligible. It makes it actually even <coughs> harder to, to understand or to square. Or, or square. So uh, yeah, I, I agree with what you said. And it, it's interesting be, because one of, what uh, Robinson tells me is that the emergence of teleology, for instance, or form, it seems to be like magic. But it's not clear as well, in their position, how we go from physics to chemistry, and then from chemistry to biology. That's also a form of magic that has to happen here. Uh, so if the magic problem applies to the morphism, I think it applies even more to uh, the closure of the physics. Uh, this is a, a sort of
sort of a general background question. Uh, and it's not well formed because uh, it's, it's just been commented. Uh, 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 causal closure can be understood in a variety of ways, as, uh, as can the notion of reduction. Nonetheless, uh, um, I, I'd like to get some reaction to the, que to, to, the, to the question, what's the relation between a ca causal closure principle and claims of reduction? They and, come to the same thing, or if not, what? How one they seems different? to entail the other, I think. Excuse I, me? I think that one seems to entail the other. So if one understands closure in this microphysicalist yeah. way, uh, as the uh, other pointed out, uh, it seems that microreductionism also follows. So uh, I, I don't know how fashionable the view that is nowadays, being a microreductionist, but it seems to follow from. from yeah, it really. Uh, so you, you seem to also inclined to feel he's, he's really come to the same thing call a cause of closure and reduction on a on a pretty broad range of more specific uh, characterizations of these yes. notions. One of, it just seems to me that the cause of closure principle is possibly too broad it's, I, I can the, the, the define a version of closure that is not uh, at odds with with Aristotle for instance uh, so w one can define closure in a variety of ways and make it uh, so broad that it basically doesn't mean anything. And it just strikes me as odd, as odd that many people, especially philosophy of mind debates, just state closure as a premise. They don't even argue for it. They just take it as granted that the, the physical world is closed. So uh, I think some philosophical work on the idea of closure has to be done. Uh, Thank you. I can ask more questions. <laughs> no, wait. no, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, this is Tom. Uh, I'll try and be quick. Um, yeah, just I thought I'd ask a question about the lights of power on the TV LMG. And um, I get a sort of nice explanation of Austin's model of the Um But I was thinking just what conclusions should we draw from that. So, for example, someone like uh, Ernest Nagel is happy to allow that often there are teleological models or explanations in different branches of science, but he thinks that there's also a me mechanistic equivalent. Yes. Now he's happy to say, you know, for pragmatic reasons, often the teleological models are helpful and have different points of emphasis which are useful. Um, but metaphysically, it's you know, it's in principle reducible to some other mechanism. So I guess um, my question for Austin and also you, why I think that that teleological model is kind of, you know, not eliminable. Yes. Um, I think because it, there's two different values. I think what I would say, and I think Austin would agree, is that people like Nagel, uh, Ernst Nagel, uh, they're, in, they're onto something, but they are just describing uh, cold records, let's say, not explaining it. So uh, what Nagel seems to be doing is, uh, in, in your paper, you also talk about this, is that there's this idea of robustness or plasticity. And they want to explain away teleology with robustness or plasticity. But they seem to me to be teleology, teleological from the start. So I don't think they're actually explaining teleology away with the sort of mechanisms they are using. They are just describing it and not actually explaining it. That's what I would say. Because their own terms are teleological. Uh, plasticity in this context is a teleological term. Uh, uh, so that's what I would say. Uh, I've got, I've got uh, two, I think, closely connected issues, which don't, uh, which are background issues to, to this whole debate. They don't apply specifically to your, your more, but uh, I'm having trouble with the details because I'm bothered by these two more general issues. First of all, when uh, we talk about uh, the question whether a complex is reducible to, uh, or whether a complex is reducible to the physics of its parts, uh, we have to remember that it's not just the 
uh, intrinsic properties of the parts that are relevant, but also their relations. And if you've got a huge number of particles, <laughs> room for a huge number of relations. So uh, there's, there's more meat at the physical level than we usually see. Secondly, let's remember that uh, in Newtonian physics, uh, you can't even solve the three-body problem. That is, there is no uh, closed analytic solution to uh, the motion of uh, a Newtonian motion of, uh, of three objects. So <laughs> how much more is this going to be true uh, for, for much uh, uh, larger, uh, larger complexes? You take those two things into consideration, and I'm left feeling that uh, the threat of, re of reduction is, uh, is, uh, is extremely weak, even if, in some sense, uh, uh, everything reduces to facts about the physical parts. That sense is when you remember that their relation that you have to include the relations. And you then have to remember that you can't figure out, in terms of the physics, what's going to happen from when when you know the initial conditions and the physical laws. Uh, that uh, even should reduction, in some sense, uh, be correct, it's an extraordinarily weak claim. It, it is. Uh, it seems so. There is a a, a broad or. Uh, naive, we'll say, I, I don't know, sense in which everything is physical, of course, uh, in the sense that everything is made of particles, at least, uh, no. Uh, so, certainly, sure, that, that if that is what you mean by reduction, that is a very weak claim as well, the idea that, very broad idea that everything is made of particles. I think the, the claim they actually need to defend is something like the physical level explains all the above want to use the above analogy levels. And yeah. that seems to be way more problematic. And one of the reasons and, and the, the, and the problems I just mentioned uh, yes, by course. themselves the, 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 the very idea of relation sometimes can only be understood uh, some physical relations can only be understood in level of chemistry. Right. Or in level of or, or much higher levels. Yes, so, yeah. much higher uh, right. Your, all your points uh, strengthen. Well and you just added an important one. Yes. <laughs> right. uh, but also so one problem with problems, and I think Kim as well, is that it's not clear what's an explanation for them and what's a cause for them. Because for art, it's all the same. <laughs> Explaining is, in, in a way, a, a form of talking about causation as well. But they have this very strict asymmetry between causes on the one hand and uh, explanation on the other hand. And, and then they, they'll have to say strange stuff, like everything above microphysics is explanation. Uh, not 